Hi, this is EJ Daigle again, Director of Robotics and Manufacturing here at Dunwoody College Technology. And I'm going to give you a demonstration on how to take some basic measurements with the oscilloscope here in our lab. Um, a couple of key features here before we get started. Um, first thing that you'll need is you'll need an oscilloscope probe. So I have a probe here, and you'll notice on the probe itself there's actually a little switch. And we talked about this in a previous lecture about a times 1 times 10 switch. So there's a times 1 position. You probably can't see that, but if you look at the scope, it says times 1 on it. And there's also a times 10 position, and that's your times 1 times 10 attenuator. So this will actually shrink that signal by, by a factor of 10 and make it smaller. So we would have to account for that if we had it on. Um, also on the probe, you'll, you'll, have some, uh, you'll have a reference lead where we'll use as kind of our zero volt reference. Just like any meter that you use, um, you have two probes. You have, usually have a red lead and a black lead. One is the one that you're going to probe in there, take a voltage measurement, and the other one is what we're considering our zero volt reference, what we're going to re uh, reference when we take that measurement. So this will be our reference lead that will go on one side of the circuit, and this will be our probe that will go on the other side of the circuit. And it's got a little spring-loaded clip on so that we can clip it into any circuit, whether it be onto a circuit board or onto a, a coaxial cable or, uh, or onto a resistor or anything like that. Um, so I always want to make sure that those look good. And then on the other end, there is a BNC connector. So there's a, a BNC connector on the other end that will actually connect directly to the scope. There's also an adjustment in here that allows you to, uh, to calibrate the scro scope if you're getting kind of a, a strange signal or something like that. So we're going to start off by uh, hooking our scope lead up to channel 1 on the oscilloscope. And this is a dual trace scope, so we have, we have two channels, channel 1 and channel 2 that we can hook up to. And we could actually read uh, a dual trace signal. We could look at two different signals at the same time if we want to, an input and an output of an amplifier circuit um, or, or anything like that. We could look at both signals at the same time. A um, couple of key features on here. The first one is the intensity. Um, one of the things you'll notice is when I turn the intensity up, it gets really, really bright. And this is a phosphorus screen, so you do want to kind of keep that intensity in check. Um, you wouldn't want to leave the intensity knob all the way bright and walk away from your scope for several hours. Um, it is possible to burn an image into your oscilloscope there. So your screensaver for the oscilloscope is just turning the intensity knob down. The other thing that you'll see is there's a focus control on the scope. Um, the focus control just allows me to go from kind of a blurry, fuzzy line up to a real crisp and sharp line. And we really want that line to be nice and crisp and sharp so we can actually tell exactly how many divisions of peak-to-peak -peak voltage or whatever it might be that we have. Um, a couple of things that you got in here too, while I have a nice flat line, is you have a ground. Um, the ground actually is going to go ahead and ground the input signal, the input channel, to the uh, to the uh, a ground itself. So we know it's a zero volt signal at this point. If I take this to ground, it's a zero volt signal. That would allow me to use my vertical position knob here and I could actually adjust that one way or the other. Let's see here, there we go, channel one. So I could adjust that up and down and I could put that right on the zero volt axis. So vertical just allows me to move that trace up and down as I wish. Um, and when I'm on the ground position, I know I'm getting a zero volt signal. So that's a great time to go ahead and zero, zero your meter there. Um, again, because it's a 100 megahertz scope, I can read signals with the scope that we'll never be able to read with a Fluke digital multimeter or a Simpson 260 analog meter. None of those, those meters are going to be able to do what this scope can do. Um, so first thing we'll do is let's take a look at a DC voltage measurement like we did on the board a few minutes ago. I'm going to go ahead and set my, uh, my, my trace here to, uh, or my, uh, my input mode to DC. So I want to look at a DC signal. I do have a DC power supply over here. Um, and on the DC power supply, I'm going to go ahead and set my DC power supply to some um, some trivial voltage. We'll, we'll pick, I'm going to guess it's about 12 and a half volts. Um, we'll find out how accurate my meter on the, on the voltage uh, supply is here um, when we put it on our oscilloscope. So we've got a, about a 12 and a half volt signal. Not sure, but we'll, we'll check it and see. So what I'll do is my, my positive lead is going to hook up to my probe and my negative lead is going to hook up to my, my reference. So I'm going to go ahead and hook my reference lead up to the negative. I'm going to take my probe and I'm going to hook that up to the positive. And that's going to be my actual signal. As soon as I do this, if you're watching the, soaps, the uh, scope screen here, um, you should see that waveform jump a little bit. So I just went ahead and did that. And if I take it off, you'll see it jump. So it jumps up. Um, just like we were talking about in the theory room, um, a DC voltage will always be above that zero volt axis. So one way to do it is to take it on and off and see how much it jumps up. Another thing that you can do is you can actually reground your signal. So I know that right now I'm reading ground, and when I go to DC on my coupling, I see it bounce up. 
Now, a great thing to do at this point would be to actually measure that. Um, as I count from the zero mark here, just like we did in the, in the lecture room, is this would be one division. From zero to here is one, two, and then I have a partial of a division. I'm actually between 0 0.2, 0 0.4. I'm in between 0.4 and 0.6. So if we take uh, 0.5, and then we're going to multiply that by my volts per division. So it's uh, 2.5 times my volts per division, which is 5 volts per division. And if I type that into my calculator, don't actually need my calculator in this case, 5 times 2.5 is about 12 volts, right? So about 12 and a half volts. Um, 5 times 2 is 10, plus another half is about 12 and a half volts. And we knew that that was a 12 and a half volt signal that we're looking at. So that's perfect. Um, that works out great. Let's go ahead and, and check our AC. Let's take an AC measurement now. I'm going to use the function generator. And so I have a BK precision function generator up here. And what I want to do is I want to take a look at this signal. I don't want to look right now and see what, I mean, I can see what the frequency is here. Um, but, and I could also take a measurement on the, the amplitude output right now. But I want to just go ahead and measure it. And then we'll go back and look at that frequency and see if we're getting what we expect. So first things first, we'll take our probe off. And now I'm going to go to an AC coupling mode because I'm expecting an AC signal out of my function generator. I'm going to go ahead and hook up my reference to the reference lead on the function generator and my probe to my hot lead on the function generator. And as soon as I do that, I get a trace on the oscilloscope. So this is great. We can actually see a trace. Again, at this point, it wouldn't be a bad idea to ground out your signal and, and just move it if need be a little bit. Just make sure your signal's right in the middle. Okay. Um, and at this point, I can take some measurements if I'd like to do that. Uh, so let's take a peek here. It looks like I have a full two divisions of, of vertical amplitude. Um, I could scale down on my volts per division if I wanted to. I could scale down. That one's probably not going to work out so well because I can't see it. It's off the screen. It's too big. I could also go to here, and that's a pretty good measurement. Um, and if it was too big, the other thing we could do that we talked about earlier is I could always go to times 10, and that would attenuate it. Times 1 times 10. But if I'm on times 10, you have to be a little bit careful because you've got to take that into account. Um, once you calculate your peak-to-peak -peak voltage, you would have to multiply that result times 10 to see what the true voltage would be. I'm going to leave it on times 1, and I'm going to go to 2 volts per division. The best resolution you can get on the scope is as close to one complete waveform that's as tall as it can get. Um, this is too tall because I can't read it. That's too small because I, have, I can make it a little bit bigger. And then the other thing that you have also is you have time per division. So besides just your volts per division, you also have time per division. Time per division didn't make any difference in a DC waveform um, because we're not going to look at any period. But time to, per division is going to have more cycles on the screen. Okay, at some point, if you're getting a trace like this, um, you probably could mess with your time per division because there's so many cycles on the screen, it can't read this. And you'll see a lot of this stuff going on when students first start using oscilloscopes. So you can try scaling down your time per division, and I can start to see the actual cycles now. And if I keep going down, I'm going to get to the point, this is still, the time per division is still, uh, still too big. I'm looking at too big of a piece of time, and I'm looking at way too many cycles in that piece of time. So I'm going to continue scaling down until I get as close to one complete waveform as I can. Um, not quite a complete waveform, so I'm going to take it back the other way. And that's a complete waveform and a little bit more. So let's go ahead and take a look at that and see how many I've got. Now, like we had our vertical position where we can move the, the waveform up and down, we also have a, a horizontal position that will allow me to move the waveform left and right. So that's our time per division. Okay? So we need two measurements on this guy now. Um, the first one's going to be our, our voltage peak to peak. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to move this. I'm going I'm to line it up with the very bottom. It doesn't really matter where the zero is because I'm looking at a peak-to-peak -peak waveform only. So I'm going to move it with my vertical position up and down until the bottom of my peaks are at the very bottom. That way I can get as close to a clean measurement as I can. So that's one division, two divisions, three divisions, four divisions. You might call it 4.9 divisions. I'm going to call it five divisions to keep my math easy, times two volts per division. Then I'm going to look at my probe as on times one. So I've got, what do I got here? Five divisions times two volts per division is going to be 10 volts peak to peak. So we know what our peak to peak AC waveform is. Okay, then I'll go ahead and position that back up. And now I'm going to try to measure my horizontal or my period. 
So I'm going to move my, my horizontal position left and right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to put it so that the waveform starts at a, at a graticule. So I can use that as a zero to measure my period. And where it crosses the plane again here, the, the x-axis, where it crosses that zero again is going to be where I'm going to measure two. So I get one, two, three divisions, four divisions, five divisions. So I'm exactly five divisions for one complete waveform. Start and then start again. One complete waveform is five divisions on my sine wave. If I take five divisions and I multiply that by my time per division, which in this case is 50 microseconds, I get a period of 250 microseconds. So this, this is a, a very short period of time that we're looking at here. Um, what's more important to us, though, is what is the frequency? If it's a 250 microsecond um, time, what is the frequency? So we'll go ahead and we'll go uh, 1 over x, and we can see that our frequency of 250 microseconds winds up being 4 kilohertz or 4,000 hertz. And if you look up here at the function generator, what is our frequency right now? It's 4,094 hertz. Now, I'd venture to say that I could probably be a little more accurate in my measurement, and maybe I'm off by, you know, 0.2 or something. But we can see it's definitely a 4 kilohertz signal, and I'm reading 4 kilohertz on the oscilloscope. A couple other things just to mention real quick here before we, before we let you go here. Um, a couple of things you've got to be careful of with the oscilloscope. Um, there's, there's one uh, control here called trigger level. The trigger level is where I'm going to start the trace. If I adjust this, you'll actually see where it starts the trace moves up and down on this axis over here. But the problem is, is if I go above or below where the trace actually starts, it's not going to find the signal to start the trace. So if you ever see this, a couple of problems you can run into. One is trigger level, and the other one could be your time per division. So if you ever come up here and it looks like this, take a look at your trigger level and see if it's that. Or if it looks like this, take a look at your time per division, because it could also be that. Lots of controls on the oscilloscope to look at. Um, one last thing is there's also a calibration uh, detent on, your t on both your volts per division, both for channel 1 and channel 2. Um, there's a little detent here called a cal terminal. And you'll see as I adjust this, it actually moves that trace up and down. The only way to guarantee that your, your marks here for volts per division are accurate is that that cal knob is in the detent. In all cases, you want that cal knob to be in the detent, whether it's for time per division, volts per division, uh, channel one, channel two, it should always be in that calibrated position. The idea there is if, let's say your scope was a little bit out of calibration, but you had a known circuit that you knew was five volts AC at you know 1.5 kilohertz, you could always uh, adjust to that with this cal terminal. And then the last thing, I'll, I'll just show you one more thing while we got a minute here, is we do have a calibration terminal on the scope itself. So if you want to check the scope for accuracy, you can always go up here to the calibration terminal. And the calibration terminal is actually going to put out a, uh, a uh, let's see here, a 500 millivolt peak-to-peak -peak signal at um, 1 kilohertz. So you can always actually check your scope against its onboard calibration terminal. So if you're getting ready to go into a panel and take a measurement and you want to verify your scope's working, you can always check it against this calibration terminal. And that, that goes to, to show also that the scope will read a lot more than just AC waveforms, than sine waves. It can read square waves. It can read triangle waves. All of these types of waveforms can be read on our, on our modern oscilloscope. That concludes this lecture on oscilloscopes. For more information on this or other topics, feel free to contact myself or the Elfman Student Success Center here at Dunwoody.